Welcome to the Orca Month Book Club. My name is Whitney Negebauer, and we are joined here by Colleen Weiler with WDC. And today we are going to be talking about Spirits of the Coast, and we are joined by Nikki Sanchez. She is a, a, a people Maya, an Irish-Scottish academic, indigenous media maker, and environmental educator. She holds a master's degree in indigenous governance and is completing a PhD with a research focus on emerging visual media technology as it relates to indigenous ontology. So Nikki and Colleen, welcome. It's great to have you both today. Hi, Whitney. Thanks for having me back as your co-host for Orca Month Book Club. And hi, Nikki. It's nice to meet you. Chloe Kanatsik, it's so nice to be here with you both. Um, I'm really excited to discuss one of my absolute favorite things on Earth, which is orcas. So you have been described as the mastermind behind this book. Um, can you explain a little bit about how you originally became interest in orcas? Absolutely. Um, I've had the incredible fortune of um, spending the majority of my life um, as a guest here on Coast Salish territories, as well as um, a little bit further up Vancouver Island in the Chalmuth territories. And um, there I've been mentored by the late Tasisa Sam and his son Kamina Sam. Um, well, I kind of developed my skills as a as a wilderness guide. And so um, my connection and love for orcas comes very, very honestly, just as, a, as one of their neighbors. I've spent so much time um, on the rivers and oceans um, around this island in my life. And as I grew up and got a little bit older and were able to get on boats and get in kayaks, um, I spent a lot of time in the Salish Sea, um, which is the home to our resident orca populations as well as the transients. So, um, getting to be with them in their natural habitat. I, I don't know many people who've ever had that opportunity and haven't fallen deeply in love and in awe with um, with orcas. And Nikki, how did that love and awe inspire you to put Spirits of the Coast together? Well, it was actually an invitation. Um, the museum has been working on this incredible exhibit, Orcas Our Shared Future, um, from conception to execution for many years. And they decided um, kind of late in the game that because the exhibition was going to be, you know, such a phenomenal one that they wanted to have an accompanying, accompanying book. And so um, they were seeking someone um, who had a knowledge of a knowledge of both like the, the history of the coast as well as of the biology and marine realities of the resident orca population. And a friend of mine, Angela Starrett, who is an incredible journalist with CBC um, was contacted and she reached out to me and at first I thought like oh no no no, this is not not something I'm qualified to do and then I realized <laughs> that I was um, and so it's a really beautiful opportunity from there forward really to work with um, Eve Rickert who's the museum's publisher who's just incredible and was such a huge part of this book and then working with the contributors Lauren Hammond and uh, Gavin Hankey and Martha Black um, to design a book that would encapsulate um, a little bit of these many different aspects of engaging with orca culture and orca biology and orca history. So that's how the book initially came to be. And this is the BC Royal Museum, is that right? That's right. And in the introduction of the book, you write about a dream that your mother had exploring some of the threats to the southern resident killer whales. Can you share a little bit more about that and, and what that, that dream meant to you and why you felt um, so compelled to share it in the introduction? Yeah, the um, I guess it would have been the summer before the opportunity to write the book came along. Um, my mom had a, a really powerful dream um, and in the dream the orcas came and took her. We, my mom lives actually right um, in Chickawitz Bay, in Oak Bay in Victoria and so they came and took her out of her bed and brought her into their underwater ecosystem and they showed her 
um, firsthand what was going on for them underwater, like the sonic assault of the big tankers and their dwindling access to Chinook stocks. And the dream was so impactful that my mom decided she needed to do something. And so there was this beautiful kind of citizens art movement that came out of that called Orca Soundings, where we um, gathered, I think we had about 40 people at the first gathering of Salt Spring and really, you know, spent a weekend workshopping how we could best engage people with our neighbors, the resident orcas. And so we decided to do that through art and we ended up making life-size orca replicas for every orca in the resident population as well as memorial um, memorial replicas for some of the ones who had passed. And since then, obviously, we've had some new orcas born and we've lost many. That's amazing. And, and the art is, is that the same art that's integrated into the book as well? Or is that kind of, did that grow out of that? Um, no, the, it's not. The, the art is really, um, you know, like life-size replicas that are designed to be brought to markets and rallies and really to be conversation starters, um, to educate people about the resident orcas and, and what's going on for them and why they're in such a critical, threatened state right now. Um, but it was, you know, I think um, anyone who is in, in or around the sea um, has been alerted in the last couple of years to what a critical time we're at for, for our, you know, we're, we're really seeing a consistent decline um, up until this year, which is, which is really exciting because we have had many orcas born. Um, but the dream, you know, was, I, I think that was when I've, I've been very much involved in environmental activism um, for most of my life, but never so much specifically around a single, um, a single species. And the orcas are really an interesting, um, they're an interesting animal because in so many ways they model and um, mirror human structure, right? They have, they have matriarchs, they um, are governed by their matriarchs and those matriarchs continue to be really a big part of their familial structures even after, um, after menopause and so there's not many animals on earth that do that and so it's been really really interesting to utilize the orcas as um, the kind of connecting thread to mobilize people around protecting marine ecosystems and it's just it's been really unique um, and and educational for me to see that there's so many people from many many different walks of life and many different cultural backgrounds that feel so connected to these whales. On that, I mean, you mentioned the the awareness and the need to get more awareness of the crisis that the whales are facing, uh, but you also wrote in the book that you wanted it to be a celebration and not a eulogy and to share, um, to, to kind of lead the movement through love and awe. So why was it important to you to take that approach rather than one of um, of really focusing in on like the, the dire circumstances? Yeah, I think, um, we are living through a time that is so riddled um, with really debilitating realities, um, you know, both around social injustice and inequity and environmental catastrophe. And when we focus on all the things that are wrong and all the odds that are stacked against us, it can cause paralysis and fear. Um, and immobilization. It's not a great place um, to motivate from. It's not a great place to drive creativity um, or empowerment from. And so I really, with all the work that I do, um, as, just as a personal practice and the way that I try to work in both with my media work and environmental organizing, I always try to come from love, right? Because that is a place that we have an infinite well of energy and inspiration and creativity and it's really going to require the best of our creativity the best of our inspiration the best of our innovation to solve the challenges that we're currently facing 
And it's a lot, it's a lot more of a beautiful experience to come from that place to be motivated and, you know, reorient consistently around what, what we're doing our hard work for. And when it's something that we love, that process, even if it's a struggle and even if it's challenging, it's a really worthwhile one and it, it, that's a good way to live. And so that's how I live my life. And I really wanted to be able to share that through the book. And I know, um, so many of the contributors, their art and, or their science, it comes from their love of the whales. And I really wanted this book to be one that um, was accessible for people of all ages. And so I'm always thinking about youth and, and children. And I think we really need to think about our children in the ways that we introduce um, the environmental challenges that we face. Because I remember as a young person first he hearing about climate change and deforestation and all the things and I had nightmares I had debilitating nightmares you know from the time I can remember and it took me a really long time um, to, or what felt like a really long time to come to environmental work as an adult with courage and and belief that we can make a difference because it felt so daunting as a child and so I really want to be able to offer something different for the young people um, who are growing up you know in the world today. One of my favorite aspects of the book is the inclusion of writings that are in indigenous languages and also translated into English. Could you tell us a little bit more about the process of preserving these stories? Yeah, I mean, I really want to just take a moment to shine a light on all of the incredible contributors that we had. I. Um, got to be the steward of bringing all of these voices together, um, but it was really, it was really an incredible privilege um, and gift to get to do that. And the credit for the book really goes to all of the contributors who who make it so beautiful and who share um, their incredible their incredible gifts in that way. And so, um, one of the choices in the book was to create as much support and as much resources as we could to um, supporting the work of um, both, I think we have Haida, Nachalnes, um, I'm trying to think if there's any other languages that are in the book, of supporting folks to work in their communities and with language speakers so that if they had a story they wanted to share or a poem, they could also work with elders and language speakers in their community to have that written in the language. And I think you know, the orcas, especially um, when we look historically, the orcas have a very long history on this coast, and so do all of the nations whose territories we um, have the privilege to to live um, and learn on. And it's only been 150 years, really, that English has ever been spoken in this place. The language of the orcas and the language of the, the coastal nations um, really are the truth, um, the true, you know, paradigm that speaks to the knowledge of this place, the knowledge embedded in the ecosystems, and so it was more appropriate than any other language that those cope. You know, we we didn't. This wasn't um, a specifically indigenous project, and um, that are dedicated entirely to to uplifting and showcasing those languages and supporting language speakers and language learners um, to do that work uh, to to share and revitalize those languages because they are so important. And the book kind of, it, it goes back and forth between those indigenous writings and languages and stories to kind of more uh, scientific and, and Western essays. And, you know, you just mentioned it's 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 that combination of both um, that kind of reflects different approaches to the orcas. So can you talk about why you decided to combine them together instead of maybe doing two separate projects? Speaking of feeling connected to them, um, and you've mentioned, you know, this this was kind of inspired by a dream that your mom had and talking about the matriarchal role um, of the orcas in their society. The theme of Orca Month this year is we are family. Uh, so mm -hmm. building on the idea that we're all one big family and the orcas are part of that family. Um, can you talk about any parallels that you see between the Orca's family bonds and your own extended family? 
Yeah, I, I think um, this is one of the most fascinating things for me about the orcas. And as I mentioned before, the orcas actually have a matriarchal family structure. And it's the grandmother orcas who hold the knowledge um, and educate the next generations of orcas about how to live, how to socialize. They're the ones who bring pods together. And this matriarchal structure is really similar to most indigenous communities around the world. Um, and so that for me is such a powerful, a powerful representation of just how my, um, another thing that really impacted me during the creation of this book as I was learning more and more about the specific local history of the way that the orcas have been hunted and commodified here um, in the Salish Sea is, you know, the um, the immense impacts that has happened intergenerationally from the loss of both young orcas and the death of their matriarchs, which are their not knowledge holders. And it was really, um, you know, a massive epiphany and a really emotional thing for me to realize just how much um, parallels there were between the way that the orcas have been exploited, um, really uh, abused and taken, taken from their home place and taken from each other. That is very similar in many ways to the way in which children have been taken um, from their families uh, since the onset of residential schools right up until um, the closing of the last residential school in 1996. And how, you know, even after those actions have ended, the impacts, um, the intergenerational impacts of that violence and the loss of transmission of knowledge, how much parallels there are um, between the way that that's impacted the orcas and the ways in which the, the legacy of residential schools continues to impact um, the generations of people who are having to live with that legacy. And so there, there was some really profoundly um, heartbreaking realities that I, you know, had to sit with in the compilation of this book, really thinking about the ways in which colonization and that uh, mentality that comes along with colonization that removes everything outside of uh, a white male Christian perspective, uh, devoid of, of meaning or humanity or worthiness um, of, its, of its inherent life and its freedom. So for listeners that are in the U.S., um, you know, in Canada, June is also National Indigenous History Month. Um, can you share a little bit more about some of the news that's going on in B.C. right now? Yeah, we have had um, a, an unspeakably uh, devastating couple of weeks here in B.C. Um, there has been, there was... Um, a survey done of one of the former residential schools in this province and a discovery of a mass grave where 215 um, bodies remains were found um, in the in the yard of a residential school so those were all children who were forcibly removed from their homes and attended that residential school and died um, while they were there and sadly um, you know, although Canada as a country right now is reeling from this news, for most Indigenous people, this is not news. Um, it's been known for a long time that the mortality rate in residential schools hovered around 50%. And so while this is the first, um, you know, uncovered grave that's being given national attention for every residential school in Canada, there is undoubtedly remains um, to be found and to be returned. And it's just the tip of the iceberg um, in, in terms of an awakening around the true reality of the, the genocidal origins of this country. <laughs> and so it's, yeah, it's been a really heartbreaking time and, and my heart and prayers um, and solidarity goes out to all of the people who are impacted by this, um, specifically the family members um, of residential school survivors. Ours too. 
Ours too. Um, from that perspective and, and as an indigenous person, what do you think is important for our elected officials to know about protecting the environment and saving the whales? That is a very, <laughs> that's a very big question and definitely requires its own, <laughs> its own episode. Um, and I mean, I, I'll just be blunt. Um, I think that our, and I'll speak as a Canadian, um, our government, our leadership are profoundly stupid in their management of lands um, and ecologies. And uh, even if your only objective was fiscal gain, um, monetary gain, the management that they are currently investing in is so short-sighted and so unsustainable and is benefiting such a small percentage of the population um, to the absolute, um, you know, there are so many people who are just barely, barely able to get by and we live in one of the most biologically diverse and ecologically rich, rich places on earth here. Um, next to the, the Amazon rainforest, we are one of the most biologically and biodiverse regions on earth. Um, and so to see, you know, to, to exist in this time in my own lifetime where I might, you know, exist to see the, the extinction of salmon. Sorry, this is really emotional for me. Um, the extinction of the salmon and the extinction of our resident orca populations, it is so unthinkable that, you know, to make a very small percentage of old white men richer than they already are, we would sacrifice um, aspects of our ecosystem and, and species that have lived here for so much longer than humans have and who carry so much wisdom that we have yet uh, to learn or to understand um, and who are such significant members of the coastal community, um, especially for their significance for the First Nations that live up and down this coast and the ways in which there have been treaties and relationships between those nations and these animals since time immemorial. And the idea that in just 150 years of colonizers being here, they have destroyed something that has evolved over millennia is just, it is so um, difficult to even, you know, really conceive of. Um, and sadly, I think that those, those politicians are so removed um, from their own, their own place in in an ecosystem, in an interconnected um, web of existence, that they really don't have the intellectual capacity to understand that. Um, it's, it's a thing of profound shame. Yeah, that is really powerful to put into context like that. Thank you for sharing. Um, can you share a little bit more about some of the future projects and directions that you have um, that you're working on right now? Yeah, um, my, you know, my work uh, is as a media maker um, and also very much as um, an activist. And so right now here, um, as we speak, there are dozens of people a day being arrested um, to try and protect the last intact old growth watershed on the island. Um, which is which is um, being deforested by uh, two men <laughs> who have inherited that the logging company and who come from generations of, of wealth and it's unbelievable to think that we'll be taking down um, two thousand year old trees to make men marginally richer and this will be the, the absolute last of old growth. Um, that was ever standing on Vancouver Island. So right now my focus is really around supporting um, the folks who are on the front lines there at Snoqualmie, um, 
territory patchy that territory and so there there's like hundreds if not thousands of people up there right now trying to prevent um those trees from being taken down so that's been a big focus of mine this month and um like we spoke about earlier the revelation of these um 215 bodies that have been found at the Kamloops residential schools has also been a big focus in terms of working for accountability from the Canadian government who is currently spending millions of dollars in court to fight um, to silence residential school survivors. So, um, well, I hope that there'll be many more, um, you know, projects that celebrate the beauty and the biodiversity and that allow me to engage more um, with the things that I really love and the things that I fight for. Right now, it's hard to pa it's hard to see past um, these current these current issues that are so significant and so defining um, for you know the lives and realities of so many people here and what the future is going to look like um, for the people who live on this coast. I hope in all that you're finding time to take care of yourself too and, and stay you know healthy um, and positive and on the protecting of old growth. Is there anything we can do from here in the U.S. to help support that effort to make sure that those trees are protected? Absolutely. Um, the, I'm on the board of the Sierra Club BC and they're doing phenomenal work um, in solidarity with frontline land defenders. So that would be the most um, simple and easy way is just to go and check out Sierra Club BC and donate to them. Um, those donations are going directly um, to support on the ground organizing. And if you just go and Google Fairy Creek right now, you'll see m so much coverage um, coming out daily. So following that and sharing it, um, it's, you know, this actually really isn't um, just an issue for, for us here on the island. Um, we all are, are reliant on the lungs of the earth. And so the more that we lose this kind of irreplaceable um, ancient forest canopy, the more that it impacts um, the rapid acceleration of climate change impacts. So um, whether you, you know, whether you live on this coast or not, this is still a fight that impacts you. So I really encourage everyone to, to, to um, follow those things, donate to the Sierra Club. And also, you know, um, wherever you wherever it is that you live learn whose territory you're on and learn what it is that they're they're experiencing right now and what you can do to be in solidarity with them because i you know the more i work um internationally the more i work here locally the more i um protecting them to have a sustainable future here on this planet. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. And where can people pick up a copy of the book? You can, I really, really encourage folks to support their local bookstores. It's been a hard year for retail. Um, so check out your local bookstore. Most places that I've, um, I've, you know, I love bookstores myself. So I make a habit of whenever I have an opportunity to stop by a new bookstore, I check in and see if they have a copy of it. And so far, everywhere I've uh, checked out has. Um, and if they don't, you can see if they'll order it in from you. Otherwise, you can get it directly from the Royal BC Museum publisher. Well, thank you so much for coming on and chatting with us today. It was just an absolute pleasure pleasure to talk with you. Um, if you like this episode, you can go on YouTube, like and subscribe. We also have audio only podcasts on iTunes. You can learn more about Orca Month at orcamonth.com. There is still one more online book club conversation on June 17th, where our listeners are welcome to come join Colleen and I to chat about our readings this month. To learn more about Whale Scout, go to whalescout.org. And to learn more about whale and dolphin con conservation, go to whales.org. Thank you very much.